Well, our series that we are in the middle of is called The Main Attraction, and uh, it's on the book of Mark. And why are we calling it The Main Attraction? Well, because the writer Mark wrote this book in such a way that he wasn't worried about featuring himself or any of the disciples. He wanted to make sure that Jesus was the main attraction of every single story uh, that he wrote down and that he told. And today, the title of our message is The Cross. We're going to take a look at... Mark's perspective of the cross today. And before we get the message kicked off, we're going to read the scripture for today. And I want to invite Libby Gonzalez to come on up to read our scripture. You know, I want you to know that we have incredible people in our church and uh, genuine people. That not perfect, but genuine people that are on mission for Jesus. And, and Libby is on mission for Jesus as an ER nurse. And uh, we know that you make such a great impact in your field. And uh, you're an incredible uh, volunteer of this house. And you can find her serving just about anywhere. Um, but Libby, when I think about you, I think about the word joy. Can you figure out why? Uh, this girl has a smile that can light up the darkest room. And we just love you. And we're so grateful for you. Hey, will you uh, read the word and get us kicked off for today? Thank you so much, Sean. That means yeah. so much. Um, so we're going to start in Mark chapter 15, verses 21 through 41, um, the crucifixion. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him uh, wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the king of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I'm going to read that again because I love this verse. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you so much, God, for that. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There was also women looking on from a distance, among who were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, as Sean always, Pastor Sean always encourages us, I just want to say um, before he brings the word to just open our hearts up to what the Holy Spirit might speak, because I know um, when Jesus is in, the, in this place, he's going to speak to us. So let's just open our hearts and I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much that you came, God, and that you died for us. God, I thank you that you came and you died for me, God, because you know I, I need you. I need that. Lord, I just thank you so much that you are in this house. You are in this place, Father God. I pray you would come and meet us in a new, in a new way. God, that you would uh, reveal to us new things, God, that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our lives. God, we open and we posture our hearts to you. Jesus, asking that you would move and you would speak, Father God. I thank you for who you are, God, that you are good, that you are on the throne, God. You truly get all the glory. You get all the honor. You get all the power, Father God. And I just pray for restoration in this place, God. I pray for, for newness and freshness, Father God, in this place. And I thank you for what you're going to do, God, because I know you were going to move. I know you're going to speak. And I thank you for that, Father God. I thank you for what you did on that cross. Thank you so so much, Jesus, in your precious and your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, I'm like, we, we, we maybe should have had her preach today. 
Thank you, Libby. We're so, we're so very proud of you. Well, um, today we're going to be taking a look at the verses that were read, and uh, we're going to be talking about the cross. And when I think about the story of the cross, I notice some things. And the first thing I notice in your notes is the reality of the cross. I notice the reality. We see this in verse 21 through 24. What is the reality of the cross? Well, in your notes, the reality of the cross is that it was scandalous. Why scandalous? Well, I don't think there's anything that outrages a community more than when an innocent person is accused. Anybody agree with me today? Uh, we not only see that in our communities, but we see it around the world. And what's worse than an innocent person being accused, not only when they're accused, but when they're actually sentenced. And why are we enraged? Well, because I think all humans, we have a sense of justice in us. We, we believe collectively that, hey, if somebody does something wrong, they, they should be justice. Justice should be served on them, correct? Yeah, right. And where do we get this sense of justice in us? Well, we get it from God. We, we don't have it on our own. In fact, the Bible says we're created in his image. And he is a God of justice. And just like we demand that the guilty pays, he too demands that the guilty pays. That's right. When is the last time somebody lied about you? When is the last time somebody said something false about you? How did you feel about that? It didn't feel good, did it? You probably wanted somebody to stand up on your behalf, somebody to tell the truth. You wanted to make sure that the real story got brought out. You wanted to make sure that justice was served on your behalf. It's scandalous when the innocent are wrongly accused. And here's what the Bible says of Jesus in 1 Peter 2 and 22. It says this, that, he committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Amen. Jesus was absolutely innocent. In fact, he did nothing wrong. The Bible calls him the perfect lamb of God. And if that's the case, why did all of the religious people want him to die? Well, because Jesus spoke the truth, and it actually disrupted their religious systems. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, from the, the most churched person to the most unchurched person in the room, every single one of us actually have religious systems. What do I mean by that? I mean, we all have a way of justifying ourselves, a way to make ourselves feel better about the wrong we've done. And for religious people, maybe sometimes it's going to church a lot, and it's, and it's reading our Bible a lot, and those things are very, very good things. But maybe for you who might, maybe you don't consider yourself a very religious person. For you, it might be, well, I know that I do a lot of wrong, so I'm going to try to do a lot of right. I'm going to try to make up for my wrong. And, and by making up for our wrongs, then we can kind of sit back with a little bit of justification for the wrong that we've done. We all want to be justified. We're talking about the reality of the cross. It was scandalous. The next thing I know about the cross is that it was also shameful. Yes. It was shameful. What does it mean to be full of shame? It means to, to feel a deep inner feeling of disgrace towards yourself. So much disgrace, in fact, that you feel that you're undeserving of love and forgiveness from another person. The Bible in Proverbs 13 and 5 actually says, the, the righteous hate what is false, but the wicked make themselves a stench and bring shame on themselves. Our sin brings shame on ourselves. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but here's the question I want to ask you today. And the question is this, have you ever felt shame? I'm not talking about like, I'm talking about deep shame, so much shame that you just couldn't even love yourself when you thought about the things that you've done. You know, I can remember some moments in my life confessing some sin where I felt that deep kind of shame. I can remember giving my heart to Christ and even the thought of approaching God's throne, the amount of shame that I felt in my heart. 
I can remember confessing sin to friends. I can remember confessing sin to my wife, the, the amount of shame. In fact, shame can be so soul-crushing, if you know what I mean. And say, shame can squeeze out the hope in our life. And I want you to imagine this for a moment. I want you to imagine that, that feeling of hopelessness and the weight of shame times 10. You know, people make a lot of bad decisions in their life because of the weight of shame. They do a lot of, make a lot of self-harming decisions because of the weight of shame. But I want you to actually imagine this. I want you to imagine the weight of sin and shame of all humanity, of all time, bearing down on Jesus as he hung on the cross because he felt every ounce of it. In verse 34 in our text, Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, it's interesting. We, we should have been the one on the cross. We deserve, when we take a true look at our sin, we deserve to be forsaken on the cross. We deserve to be left for dead. We're talking about the cross today. So far, we've noticed the reality of the cross. I also want to talk about the result of the cross. We see this in verse 34, 38 through 41. What is the result of the cross and what did it accomplish? In your notes, it resulted in an exemption. An exemption means that you are freed from something that you owe. It means that you are released from something that you owe. What do we owe? Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Anybody ever sinned in here? You don't have to raise your hand, but, you know, if you just want to confess a little bit, just raise your hand. I've sinned. I, I've, my hand's up. Both hands are up. My toes are up. All ten of them, everything. It says the wages of sin is death. That's what we get when we sin, and not just death here on earth. And, and just to make it clear, every time we sin here on earth, Death enters the world around us. Think about it. When we sin against our loved ones, our spouses, our children, death and separation enters that relationship, and that relationship begins to crumble. Anybody ever been there before? When we sow sin into the workplace and into our friendships and into the world around us, our careers begin to crumble, and corruption begins to enter. That's just what sin does. But that's not the worst thing that sin does. The worst thing that sin does is it actually brings death to our eternity. It means that we are actually separated from God in eternity. That is the ultimate penalty of death. And the scripture goes on. Somebody say, but... But the free gift, in other words, God is saying, I am offering you an alternative option that you don't have to spend eternity separate from you. But in fact, there's a gift that God wants to give you. Anybody ever received a gift before? Anybody love gifts? I mean, let's not lie in here. Raise your hand like you just don't care if you like a nice gift, right? Especially somebody who just loves you a lot, right? And they know how your heart ticks and they, they know the things that you like and they come bring a gift that you love and they come bring it with so much joy. And you don't pay for that gift, you just receive it and you just say, thank you. Sometimes you just, you want to say more than thank you. The words just aren't enough, but just that's all you could say. Words can't even express the gratitude. Well, Jesus came and offered us a free gift through the life of Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross. Now, if you have any sense of justice in you, this makes no sense. Because, you see, if, if you're like me, you see this and you go, that's not right. It should not be that way. It, it is not fair, which leads me to the second result of the cross in your notes. It resulted in an exchange. See, a few verses before the death and resurrection of Jesus, there's a story in the Bible that talks about an exchange. Pilate, the Roman governor, actually didn't find any guilt in Jesus. And he looked upon Jesus, and the Bible says he could find nothing wrong with the man Jesus. Everything that the religious people were accusing him of, he, he couldn't find anything wrong. So he reminded the community of people. He said, hey, guys, we actually have a, a law in our Roman law that, that allows us to free one guilty prisoner every year. 
and, and you guys just won't give up. You're, you're going you're gonna to deem him guilty. But I want to let you know that today we are going to release one prisoner. So he gave them a choice between Jesus and between a man named Barabbas. What you need to know about Barabbas is he was known as a notorious murderer in their community. Now, most of us in the room, we, we would probably say, well, that's a no-brainer. And Pilate actually thought the same thing. He thought, Jesus is innocent. So if I present the notorious murderer, Barabbas, to the people up against Jesus, there's no doubt that there's no way they're going to let Barabbas go. He's a clear murderer. They're definitely going to let Jesus go. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily say that he thought that, but I can only imagine that he did. And to my surprise, they bring Jesus and Barabbas up to the crowd, and he asks them, who would you like to be freed? And the crowd shouts, free Barabbas. The murderer, the sinner who deserved death, but there was an exchange. The innocent Christ for the guilty Barabbas. And again, I can only assume in this room that every person in this room would say, that's not right. But here's the beauty of this exchange is that we are all Barabbas. We have all sinned. We have all maybe not murdered with our hands, but the Bible says hate in the heart is just as murder. We may have not had illicit affairs and done all kinds of crazy things and cheated physically against our spouse and our loved ones, but the Bible says if we even think about it in our heart, it's like we've done it in our flesh. Romans 3.23 says this about all humanity, everybody all humans have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We are just as guilty as Barabbas is. There's no reason why justice should be served for you and I in this way. We deserve the cross. Verse 24 in our text, the God of all of heaven and earth, I can only Imagine him. He did it with his actions, but I can imagine him saying this with his mouth. As people were shouting, some were saying, crucify Jesus. Some were saying, free Barabbas. I can imagine Jesus shouting, free Barabbas and take me. I can imagine that your name was on his mind, that your life was on his heart as he shouted your name and said, Free them, Father. Take me. The last thing I notice in the crucifixion story is the response to the cross. I notice two responses in verse 35 and 36, actually through 39. The first response is this, that I see that some shouted, they continued to shout. They didn't care. They, they wanted justice. They just, they wanted to see justice served. The religious community was so riled up and they had lied about Christ and they had spread rumors about him and they had a whole group of people that were willing to join their party. And people were just intoxicated with murder in their hearts toward Jesus. These religious people loved their religious devotion more than they loved God. And there's a lot of people like that in religious circles today. And some continue to shout, crucify him. Why? They saw the life of Jesus. They heard the stories. And they saw his love but they were unaffected by him. They were blinded by their own goodness, by their own ability to justify themselves. They thought it was gonna be good enough. But friends, I, I want you to know today, just as the people in our story, you and I, there is nothing 
that I can do. There is nothing that you can do that can ever pay the consequences of your sin. There's nothing can, that can justify us in the presence of a holy God. No amount of actions, nothing. There was a second group in this crowd. Some shouted, and the next thing in your notes, some submitted. After participating in the crucifixion himself, there was a soldier who saw Jesus for who he was. Let's take a look at what scripture says. It says this in verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him as he participated in crucifying Jesus saw that in this way, dying on the cross is what it's talking about, that he breathed his last breath. And the centurion soldier said, truly, this man is and was the son of God. invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes today. The question for you today is what will be your response to the cross? Will you join those who shouted crucify him and continue to live your life the way you're living unaffected by the message of the gospel? Be like, be like the centurion soldier who submitted his life to Jesus and recognized his lordship and recognized his sonship and recognized that he is the only one who could take away their sins. See, why would we come to Easter today and not be affected by the cross? See, if we are, we're just like all the other religious people that were out there. You might even be saying, but I'm not religious. Well, you came to church on Easter Sunday today. So why pass up this opportunity? He took your place on the cross so that you could receive his life today. He was rejected for you so that you could be accepted by God. He was cursed for you on the cross so that you could be blessed by God. He was judged and condemned so that you could be accepted by the Father. And today he invites you to surrender your life today.